mostly would like it read in so I can we can do that later and I can send that yes. to you. Um, would anyone would love to hear your thoughts? Nancy. I feel pretty strongly that we need to join litigation against consolidation. Thanks. Yeah. Want to elaborate or? I believe that uh, local control of the small group is very important for us to more closely answer our needs and control our own debt. Yeah. Any thoughts, Katie? Yeah, I also am here because I support you joining the litigation against the forced merger. Um, there, there are so many issues. One, um, many other forced mergers that have happened have resulted in school closings, and in many cases, those students um, suffer greatly by traveling. I work in a district where now students are traveling 22 miles to our school. And then, um, as well, in the district where I work, certain opportunities that used to be offered at the middle school are no longer offered because they can't accommodate all students because they can't accommodate students who are traveling 20 miles um. to get to Montpelier, um, which then impacts the opportunities that are available that students used to have. Um, and again, I just agree with the importance of local control and I really, um, I want to see that new change. So I support fully the joining the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear this, Chris? I can. Okay, Thank you. great. Um, and uh, we just had a number of um, several other Middlesex citizens join us. Um, David Lawrence, let's see, Kyle, Landis Marinello, and Charlie Charles Merriman. <laughs> um, and we're in the public comments and correspondence um, section of our agenda. So um, and we'll move directly after this into the discussion of a possible lawsuit. So um, other thoughts? Yeah. I once again also support litigation. I think we need to control other schools. I think force force consolidation, as Carlos point out, is going to affect the quality of uh, education for our children. And it's going to affect the you know, I really see that things like school programs are things that are going to be much easier to happen and not going to be as much discussion about how it affects communities. I think that's all things that need to be stay local and stay other thoughts? I haven't even heard of the litigation yet, but I'm on board. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a great That's client, fine. David. I, I can only imagine because I'm no fan of what this state is going for here. So, um, I, I suspect it's directly aligned with Okay. <laughs> great, yeah. Kyle. Um, I said this in a larger meeting, but I don't know. There for it, that I was just really struck by the fact that the state board only spent five minutes actually looking at this document that was the culmination of several years and hundreds, if not thousands, of combined hours of work and thought and uh, um, just people trying to do the best for our schools. And I think we came up with a plan that would have been the best for our schools, and they spent Thanks. I have something impertinent. This is just um, the statement that was crafted last time. It was sent to the school like, for the board. So for the okay. Yeah. From now, who is this? This from? is the board statement. This is just your. Oh, copy. okay, great. Um, so this is the statement from from last us time. to Krista Hewling and the rest of the Vermont State Board of Education. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I think it probably makes sense if our future further comments um, to do a brief Act 46 update. Um, sure. Yeah. Chris, do you want to um, do that? Um, I'll, yes, I'll do my best. So we have a, a decision from the state board, provisional decision, a compelling merger of all the uh, local boards uh, at, in the Washington Central Supervisory Union. Uh, there's not been a final determination, but it's pretty clear what they're going to do with final determination. And so um, now I think is the time for us to um, come to a decision on whether we want to join the lawsuit that is um, going to be filed at some point challenging uh, the authority of the 
uh, board to compel mergers. And it, so I think we're at that point right now. Um, so that's, that's where we're at. Thoughts, questions? <clears throat> yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think that's it. I, you know, I've sent out a few updates. Hopefully people know where we're at regarding what's happening, the goals of Act 46. Does anybody have any questions about Act 46 while we're here? Do you all feel reasonably up to speed? So we created a statement. Um, let's see. I well, move that I get to read let, this. Yeah, let me just um, say, first of all, so we, um, there has been further information on the lawsuit. Um, oh, yeah. I, I can't really speak to the legal basis of that. I think probably we have a couple of attorneys in the room who can. Um, but uh, what we do know is that it will not, that there is no financial commitment for Romney to join this suit, that there has been uh, fundraising done and that there's, I guess, a GoFundMe or something like that. Um, so that um, to, to vote yes on a lawsuit is not necessarily to, um, to make any kind of commitment. In fact, specifically, it is not making any kind of commitment. Um, and then some, I think it was, well, somebody was explaining, Kyle was explaining to us last time perhaps that litigation is often um, dependent on sort of, uh, this type of lawsuits tends to be less expensive for one thing. And secondly, there's so many schools involved that the cost would be shared amongst a lot of people or we'd end up paying part of that cost. So it's it really seems from the best of our understanding like a financial commitment would be very minimal for the community, which for me, um, and I think for Woden as well, made our decision to do this without a specific vote from the electorate much more palatable. We are willing, if it's a very small commitment, to make this kind of decision without asking our constituents if that's reasonable for them. Yeah. There's, there's also um, significant volunteer lawyer time that is going into the lawsuit, uh, and there has been a GoFundMe fund uh, raising money already, mm -hmm. and I think the fund is approaching $5,000 if it hasn't already exceeded that, that amount. Okay. Okay. Kyle, did you have something you wanted to say? I just to give an update on the numbers. I think okay. in the last meeting I said there were 10 or 11 that had voted to join the litigation. It's now around 22, I believe, and that's of the uh, 37 that would be forcibly merged. Wow. So, uh, okay. That's 22 pounds? Yes. 22 pounds. Yeah. Or right. districts, I think, specifically. Uh, yeah. So the first, I just wanted, uh, Charlie Merriman, I just wanted to, first of all, disclose that I likely will be uh, one of the counsel on the lawsuit. So previously I expressed my support for the lawsuit, and I want you to know that I'll get some remuneration out of this as well, okay? So now you all know. Um, the, uh, the other thing that I wonder if you consider is maybe a, a joint meeting with a slug board. Oh, we have this select board might get behind this, and, and I think that's got some good gravity. Okay. Do we? Uh, what do we do with that? Do we? Should we um, make a plan to meet with the select board? Do you want to think about that? Uh, when's the next select board meeting? Anybody know? I should know that. I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. what? Do you want me? I, I'd be happy to take the lead on sort of seeing. And setting up a date. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Be, uh, Great. Okay. Yeah. The what we have come up with at this point says that the the school board supports a legal action. So I think that could easily be morphed into the town of Middlesex supports or the select board and the school board. Yeah. So I feel like we should proceed as. Great. Okay. And, and it's, it that goes back to the same oddity that really the school district and the town are one and the same. Right. It's not yeah. a separate right. corporate entity. That's a school district. Right. It's, it is the town. So. It's consistent with my view, anyway, that the uh, that the school, uh, Rummy School, is owned by the town. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to both of you because, um, for communicating like your front porch forum and so on. Especially for me, I'm out of town a lot, but even for a lot of other people who don't get to participate in these, I know there's been some controversy over the use of the front porch forum and all, but I think it's a real and Facebook is a real positive thing for the community as a whole. Thank you. So, Allison, did you have a motion? I move that we adopt a statement of Rum a statement that Rumney Memorial School Board um, supports legal action to present prevent a forced merger of the school with other elementary schools in the WCSU. 
And we have a statement. Is now an appropriate time to read it? I think that would all be part of the motion. Is that uh, so? All right. So. So yeah. Why don't you read it? All right. Um, I move that we adopt the following statement. The Rumney Memorial School Board supports legal action to prevent a forced merger of the school with other elementary school districts in the Washington County Supervisory Union. Should it be asked to join, the Rumney Board agrees to be a plaintiff in an expected suit. The Rumney Board believes that the expected decision by the State Board of Education to forcibly merge the Washington Central Elementary Schools into a single district would violate both the letter and spirit of Act 46. Vermont's General Assembly made it very clear that it welcomed alternative governance structures in districts that could demonstrate that they were meeting the goals of the law. The goal of Act 46 is to create sustainable systems of education delivery that are designed to meet identified state goals while recognizing and reflecting local priorities. State goals include promoting a student population that meets or exceeds state quality education standards, increasing efficiency by promoting the economy of scale and increasing flexibility of resource sharing, including staff, facilities, and equipment. Act 46 recognizes that merger may not be the best option for all districts. Substantially invalid debt is listed as a sufficient obstacle to preclude forced merger. The Board of Education has so far dismissed Rumney's proposals for an alternative governance structure in an arbitrary and cursory manner. The Board of Education has simply glossed over the issue of imbalanced debt and has proposed no reasonable mechanism for dealing with it. Additionally, the Board of Education has not recognized the value of the substantive and ongoing efforts of all members of the WCSU to work together and meet the goals and spirit of Act 46. The Rumney School Board is dedicated to providing the best possible education for its students at the most reasonable cost to our taxpayers. The Board of Education has not provided any explanation for how forced merger of the WCSU districts would increase efficiency or promote student learning in our unique case, nor have they provided any reasonable way of dealing with the difficulties of a forced merger that a forced merger would impose on our citizens. Finally, our electorate has repeatedly opposed a merger. For these reasons, the Rumney Board is elected to oppose the forced merger in the strongest possible way. Is there any discussion on that? A second. Oh, yeah. I would offer a friendly amendment to say that uh, we move to join the lawsuit rather than support it, um, because I think joining it has more of a, it's, it's what I hope we are doing, rather than just being on the sidelines saying, yeah, we support you guys, that we are joining in uh, with the litigation. And so, it may be a semantical dis difference, but so maybe I, I am. The Rumney, the Rumney Board agrees to join in an expected suit? Yes. Do we need to say join as a plaintiff or is join sufficient? I think join is enough. Okay. All right, my Rogers rules aren't very good, so what do we do now? Do we have to, that's a friendly amendment, do you accept the amendment? Is that what happens? If, so we if move, Allison will accept the amendment, it would be a friendly one. I do, so I would move to accept the statement as amended. Question mark? <laughs> Help us out. <laughs> um, okay, and I will second the amendment. Brian is just walking in now. Um, do you, while Brian gets himself situated, does anybody have any comments, any, do you hearing any language that we might want to pay attention to? Kyle? Uh, just two things. One, the Washington County should be Washington Central uh, for sentence. And the and, Washington uh, Central, yep. And then I guess it's based on just what Chris just said, and then the next sentence is a little confusing because it starts with should it be asked to join, and as I understand it, the board has been asked to join, and so. Okay, so just maybe. delete should it be asked to join. So we changed that to just. Um, the Rumney Memorial School Board supports legal action to prevent a forced merger of the school with other elementary school districts in the WCSU. The Rumney Board agrees to join in an expected suit. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And you've got, this is the master copy here, right? Yeah. There's a couple of those. Okay. Good. Anything else? Do you want to hear it one more time, Chris, or are you, you good? No, I'm, I'm good. Okay. We'll let Brian read it. Oh. Chris, how much time do we have with you? Uh, another 10 minutes. Okay. 
add to this? Who drafted it? Um, Scott Skinner originally proposed some language. I made some pretty significant changes. Um, and I actually sent it to, let's see, Carolyn said she couldn't be here, so I sent it to her to see if she had anything to say about it. And then, she, yeah, that's it. Did you hear back from me? Um, no, but I could check again now. I hadn't as of before the meeting. Um, we have several emails uh, from citizens who've asked to have their uh, statements read into the minutes. I think all of us have seen them, um, but I can, while Brian is reading, maybe I can read those aloud. Uh, I think that was the understanding. Uh, first one is from Patrick Wood. Dear Romney School Board, please vote to join the Act 46 lawsuit to stop the force merger of our school district. Based on info shared by several board members along with recent news articles, my understanding is that, there, that, is that there the suit has some strong legal arguments and the risks of participating in the suit are low. In contrast, the risks of a forced merger appear high and could have adverse financial, social, educational, and community impacts on the education of our children in our town. Please do all that you can to prevent a forced merger. Thank you, Patrick Wood. Should I keep going, Brian, or are you ready to talk about this? Or? I don't have anything to add. Okay. 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 Um, so let's, uh, I guess, call, we'll call the question. Ready? Yeah. Um, all those in favor of the uh, motion submitted by Allison, please vote aye. 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 All those opposed? Yeah. Would anyone like to explain their vote? No? Aye. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to. Okay. Um, yeah. I uh, sort of winging it here. Um, uh, I think that uh, I stated a lot of things at our last meeting, um, but I understand why folks are interested in pursuing this. Uh, I understand why um, there are issues um, that, the, you know, that brings us to the level of, of taking a, a, a lawsuit against the state. Uh, I, for me, I just don't think that this is one of those those moments um, uh, where we challenge us. And I think it's in part because I, well, I recognize the concern in the real. You know, quite frankly, there are aspects of this that um, that I don't like. Uh, I agree with sentiments that people have uh, sent us uh, communications on, probably folks have, uh, have mentioned uh, here tonight. Um, but when I get down to thinking about um, what it is in terms of what I see my, what has got me involved in the school board is that idea of helping um, each kid or the idea that each kid deserves the opportunity to realize their potential. And um, I think that when we look at U32 and um, you know, some of our kids are there, some of our kids have gone, some of our kids will go, and we look at that graduation uh, stage and the kids walking across that to accept their diploma, doesn't matter if they're from Callis or from Worcester um, or from Middlesex. Uh, we all hope uh, and are cheering for their success uh, in future endeavors. And I don't see why we can't have that same investment in a four-year-old or an eight-year-old uh, or a 12-year-old. And uh, you know, a big part of, for me, of um, that idea of helping kids re uh, realize their potential is closing the achievement gap that exists in our own school and across the supervisory union. And I think um, what's a lot more uh, effective and it ultimately serves a greater purpose uh, when we're all working together um, across schools uh, to do that. You know, I look at, we teach our kids, uh, at least I think we do, uh, not to build walls but to tear them down. And, uh, to me, this is an opportunity to do that. Um, so um, that's, that's kind of where I'm at on this. 
Thanks. Anyone else extend their vote? I guess I, I would just, I actually came about it in a very similar way. I just came to different conclusions. So when I think about equity in schools and I think about trying to put, trying to make the approach more uniform, I have a hard time when I look at stories and other data understanding how that can be like it feels like it feels like the the smaller approach is better able to address inequity although the larger approach would absolutely address inequality but I don't think we have an inequality problem I think we have an inequity problem so um, so I think for for me is I think there's a difference between uh, uniform and unified and uh, you know it's like kids um, you know we have three kids right they we they have different characteristic traits they have different personalities they have different strengths weaknesses uh, but you want them to all to to be successful and uh, and so they're all you're all seeking sort of a common outcome for them and that's success and but how that goes about might be slightly different and so I don't I'm not I'm not arguing for for necessarily you know straight out of a box you know thing I just I think that's uh, uh, but I but I would say that um, we're s small let's not forget what we're talking about in terms of scale we're talking you know 1500 not even 1500 people uh, so I, I think um, that's uh, we're already talking pretty small scale. Uh, Chris, I know we're about to lose you. Do you you want to say anything no, or? I I do. I think you know I think the thing that we are potentially missing here um, in terms of serving our community and our students is that I think the local community has a better feel, and and particularly the school staff and the principal have a better feel for our individual student needs. I think when we um, consolidate authority away from the local community, there's less of that sense of what an individual student may need um, because the centralized authority is not looking locally, they're looking across the system as a whole. And so I think the failing of Act 46 is that it doesn't take that aspect into consideration it assumes an efficient, a business type efficiency, and our students are not widgets. Uh, and I think that centralization is very harmful. Uh, and you know, as much as everyone might think that it, it, it can create greater efficiency and can more resources, I actually don't think that happens. I think it creates more administration, which takes away resources from um, serving kids' needs. So I think the, what we're doing here, and hopefully uh, we'll maintain our local control over uh, providing resources to our students. Um, and Brian is absolutely right in terms of working across uh, town lines, um, but in, in our community in responding to the survey that was put out was all in favor of that. Uh, but they also were in favor of maintaining the local board, uh, maintaining the local board and sharing resources and we should be doing that. Uh, but to go along with having um, the resources allocated from a distant place, and even though your 32 is not that far away, it becomes a distant place for the central office, uh, I think that would be a mistake. And I think it would ultimately be harmful. Thanks. Um, I would just add, uh, kind of to summarize some of the stuff I've said previously, that uh, my concern, um, I, multiple concerns, one thing that I, that's uh, really um, compelling for me is to look at places where school district consolidation has happened and where school consolidation has happened and look who is benefits and look who is harmed. And invariably it is people from the smaller, poorer surrounding towns who lose property value, they lose, their kids have to drive further, um, they lose connections with the school and, um, uh, you know, with the, with whatever this, you know, this kind of more centralized um, 
school is and um, you know there are a couple perhaps like a couple AP classes or you know some kind of uh, some sort of additional kind of educational um, offerings but that they do not outweigh for those kids and those communities the tremendous loss um, which is both economic and uh, and um, in terms of relationships does that does that assume that schools close um, it's it's both in certainly in the cases where schools close yeah because so. to me and to, for me um, I think um, I'm not for schools closing. I'm for filling them, and um, you know, this becomes a responsibility that we collectively share as a larger community to ensure sure that we're not closing schools, that we're not creating those uh, those potential disparities uh, as a result. And so, I think it's just a way of, in which we look at this is. Um, or whether we're for it or against it, what can we make of, of, of the situation and turn it into an opportunity? Um, and so. Thanks, yeah. Um, I think we've all had a chance to explain our votes. Um, Chris, if you need to leave us, you can. I um, just to, Thanks, so. Okay. Thank you very much. Fly well. Thanks for yep. nominating. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Um, I'm just going to continue, um, Brian, here's, we're going to um, really get, slim down our agenda and focus just on the things we absolutely have to do so we can have a fuller discussion um, with two board members later. Um, but Christy, for, um, because we had various people who asked that their um, messages be read, I'm going to finish reading those now and then we'll close our, our discussion on this topic. Um, this is from Susan Bettman. Dear members of the board, I'm adding my voice to those who support joining the lawsuit to prevent forced merger of the schools in our district. I plan to attend this evening's meeting, but if I'm not able to be there in person, I would still like to express my opinion. Thank you for your continuing hard work on behalf of our children and our community. Sincerely, Susan Bettman. Um, this is from Mike Klein. Um, Dear Rummy and U32 school boards, I'm writing to lend my voice to the call for Middlesex to join the Act 46 lawsuit that I believe is the only way to get the state to honor local control and school governance. I believe that if merging the elementary school boards within the Washington Central District was the best thing for our children and our community, we, the five towns, would vote to do it. I acknowledge the role of the state in getting towns to consider ways to increase efficiency and learning opportunities through incentives, but I believe we should always guard against ill-founded state dictates that have no real basis in protecting the interest of the state. Once we lose our local control and governance slash administration of Romney and it's taken over by the district superintendent, we can never go back. I would like this letter to be read into the minutes. Thank you, Mike Klein. Um, from Susan Bitterman, I'm a 41-year resident of Middlesex and I'm very unhappy with the prospect of a forced merger. Please know that I support a legal challenge. I wholeheartedly agree with Scott Skinner's post to Front Porch Forum. Tell the board you want them to fight for continued local control of Romney and not go down without a fight. Please do not go down without a fight. Thank you. Sincerely, Susan Bitterman. Um, and Joanne Bridenstine. Hello, Romney and U32 board members. I'm writing as a Middlesex resident and as a school employee to urge you to join the lawsuit regarding the forced merger under Act 46. All the preliminary work the Act 46 committee did demonstrated that the majority of residents of the five WCSU towns oppose this merger for many different reasons. My main objections are the loss of local governance, you all, and the sharing of unequal debt among residents of towns who never got a say in creation of that debt. I voted for the Romney bond. My friends in Worcester and Callis did not. As we all know, Act 46 does little to nothing to lower taxes. That's where the real burden is. So this forced merger may make it more convenient at the upper administration level due to having fewer meetings to attend, while the residents of five very different school communities will lose their individual voices in how their children are educated. And I don't believe a state for a second when they say this is not a ploy to close small schools. Worcester and Callis, beware. One size does not fit all. Please join the lawsuit and continue fighting this battle on our behalf. Thanks, Joanne Bridenstine. Um, and Christy, I will send those to you so you have them for the minutes. So did you, so Susan Clark also wrote in support. I did not get that. And Barbara Buckley. Oh, yep. Do we get Barbara Buckley? So what I do when I get public comment is I say, do you want me to read this into the minutes? And if they say yes, I do read it into the minutes. And if they say no, or if I don't hear from them, I don't read it into the minutes. But I'm not sure we have a concerted policy on That's that. That's true. And so. I didn't ask these people if they wanted their specific comments read in. I got a lot of people saying that they want to join the lawsuit. Yes, yeah. and nobody saying actually not to. Okay. But maybe that just depends who they contact, like I clearly indicated that I was. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
Um, so let's um, close that part of the discussion. Okay. Um, thanks so much. Um, you're welcome to stay or, um, or not. Um, we're going to, um, Amy, I'm not sure if you were, oops, things. there she is. Um, Amy, we're going to skip the student monitoring report and student guarantee and have that conversation when there are all five of us here, um, presumably at our next meeting. Uh, board work plan 3.2. Um, Allison, I feel like you've been in charge of that, but I'm not sure we have. I think we tabled that. We, we tabled, tabled that, that as at well? the beginning, yeah. Okay. Um, that's right. Uh, budget process. So, Amy, can you lead us through that? So, reviewing uh, this month's financials. You'll see that there um, were two areas where a staffing change with new hires has resulted in um, some gains. The um, only other change was the reserve for the health insurance recapture, which was approved by the board. And I think I gave you the board orders. Yeah, so you're right here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, questions, comments from board members? Um, okay, great. Um, staff board relations and communication, we'll, again, we'll do that um, when we um, meet in the, in the larger group. I think it's too important not to do there. 3.5, Act 46 update, we've done. Um, reports to the board, um, administration, fiscal. Did so did, oh, you, you just, just gave us the board. fiscal, but we didn't do the, but I guess 3.3 was the budget process. That maybe Bill is mm -hmm. going to lead yeah, us through it, or is that Kelly? Can you help us with that? I, I don't know what that's. Okay, so let's postpone that until um, we see if Bill we can get Bill to join us. My guess also is that the student monitoring report and the guarantees will inform the budget process. That's a good point. Yep. So. Yep. Okay. Um, so you did the fiscal report, Amy. Four point one administration. Is that? Yours or is that bill or? Uh, mine this month was the monitoring report. It's the monitoring report. Mm -hmm. Okay. I feel like that is such, there's so much to discuss there that we should do that um, in our, with all five, or at least with a larger group. Um, but if other people would like to um, talk about it, we can. Yeah. A quick question. Yeah. I don't know the term of art, but yeah. in this case, when you talk about monitoring, Talking about the surveillance state, or are we talking about <laughs> testing? Or, I mean, there's a couple different interpretations. Which aspect is student money? The chips in their teeth, you mean? Yes. <laughs> the little bulky. Actually, I will tell you, no joke, if you go into Berlin Elementary and you look in the lockers, there's a little, in each one, there's a picture of the principal, and it says, I'm watching. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that is not where I thought that was going. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of amazing. But in this case, we are talking about. <laughs> no, in this case, yeah. Student achievement. Okay. Um, how about, so Amy, you prepared a, a report tonight, is that correct? That's, that's correct. So how about, I would love to see it, and that way, what if um, we could see it now, and we could make sure to mark on the time so we can let Caroline and Chris know when to watch it, so we can save some time at our next okay. discussion? Would that be reasonable for everyone? What do you think, Brent? I'm fine with that. Is this... Yeah. Can it's you tell us what time we're at on the recording, please? in your spare time, Amy? Uh, it takes quite a bit of time, believe me. The glories of triangulation. <laughs> Paper copies of things, and I never I do. I printed it out. Oh, you did. Oh, you yeah. Did. You work someplace I've, where you can do that. Yeah, I went to. Uh, it, I got it off of the. It was on the WCSU. Okay. Yeah, I did see. I read it there. I just. Um, it's so much easier to read. Yeah. Okay. Amy, do you feel that uh, to um, 
Kelly's point that what's discussed in here would be helpful to be fresh in people's minds as we talk about the budget. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking it's going to be, I think we have two weeks before next meeting, but is this the type of thing that would be helpful to set the stage for uh, a further budget conversation that same evening, or do you think it's fine to... I, I think it's um, nice to have a little bit of time to mull it over and okay. to consider um, just overall um, kind of what areas we want to together mm -hmm. so, as you start to consider budget and that you know, sort of thing. So, I think in addition to that, it's helpful to kind of get into these routines where you know what type of monitoring will be done at various points in the year. Um, you know, we've got our October monitoring report typically and then the one in May. Um, so we, um, you know, went through uh, that spring monitoring report. I believe it was the end of May, if I'm not mistaken. So. Do you have that document that we could send to Krista to put in the minutes for the people who are yeah. yes. writing? I said it was a separate document. I saw that. It was clever of you. Do we want to do other business while we're trying to wait for this to yeah, load? No, that's fine. Um, okay, so let's move to... Um, What's next? So reports to the board, fiscal, we got administration. Oh, I think um, one thing is uh, under, I guess it sort of falls under here, is that um, one of our constituents asked me about the principal evaluation, sort of what's going on. You have, a, I guess, mm -hmm. Amy, gather Amy has a two-year contract. Um, and so no. there will be. Oh, okay. Maybe let's do this. Yep. Sorry, we switched rooms. Yeah. I like the pig head, the bloody pig head. That's not, is that what that is? I thought it was Alf. Oh. Lord, I'm going with Lord of the Flies. I thought, yeah, I, I thought it might be a. Yes. There's a sign on it. There's not touch unless you're red, Lord of the Flies. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this report is focused on some of the things that we should be focused on for the year. Table of contents, I'm sure you've seen. Um, the format is pretty typical between elementary schools, so you can kind of get a sense of the type of information being shared. Um, great picture to see there. Um, again, you know, our focus is uh, to nurture and inspire in all students the passion, and creativity, and power to contribute to their local and global communities. And I feel, um, and we put the SLOs up there as well as the transferables to speak to um, those things that we're working on developing our kids. And I think you'll be you excited mean? to see some of the um, opportunities. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Is it possible to have that swing so we, you can actually capture it? Are you able to capture it, or are you just able to capture the sound? Um, I can try and angle it over here to capture the screen. <laughs> that would be great. That's fine. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a yeah. minute. Um, so anyways, I'm excited to share with you some of our results from this year. So one of the uh, areas I want to just focus on is what we're doing around transferables. And as you can see, um, I'm going to show you some examples just over the last year of what we've done school-wide and some of the areas of focus that we've developed. Uh, with creative thinking and problem solving, um, this was our uh, fundraiser for Puerto Rico dance that was student initiated and um, was in response to uh, recovery efforts there. 
that was all developed by kids, and uh, they worked around the various parameters that were given. They um, handled identifying a worthy cause that um, the money collected could go to. Um, family su supported. It was a great uh, kind of problem solving for something that they saw in the world. Um, we're developing uh, more opportunities to start that effective and expressive communication as um, a whole. Um, by having more um, students and classes share out um, on their learning in their classrooms to the school community and to celebrate that together. And um, here you, you see um, both first grade and sixth grade sharing. Um, in addition, I had feedback from parents that indicated that they wanted more advanced planning around that. Um, so we're, we've tried to map those out and we're trying to do better about sending reminders so people can actually um, plan on attending. Um, but kids are being given more and more reps, I think, um, as far as giving those some, um, a variety of ways to kind of express and communicate um, about their learning. Um, I think one of our best examples in the last year of engaged citizenship was um, how our kids were able to come together not only identify the big four um, and name it, um, but also decide on a playground design, which they're now enjoying. So thank you again for your support. Um, deciding on that as um, a group and shaping their local community, I thought was very empowering for them. Um, working independently and collaboratively, um, this uh, shows both that independence uh, with our spelling bee chants. I don't know if you've all heard, but um, we're headed on to regionals, and that shows both their uh, work independently as well as collaboratively. In addition to that, um, how we pulled together as a school to do the mass mailings both to each other as well as to the entire town of Middlesex last year was um, a moment of pride, I think, for the, for the kids who pulled off all 700-some postcards. Informed, integrated, and critical thinking. Um, you know, I think our teachers do a great job of developing some um, rich projects. This um, one on the right was one that was developed uh, with technology as well as uh, within library class, um, where students did uh, little uh, book snippets for our online catalog. So that was a, some great integrated thinking. They then shared uh, their book reviews uh, with the whole school. In addition to that, um, most recently we've been developing um, interviews with Middlesex elders in preparation for the What's Next Middlesex. Um, and they were so great to just really think through both the types of questions that would be really interesting for people, but not only that, but to analyze where the most you know, uh, interesting segments were. And um, to be able to think on their feet um, based on the feedback in the interview, you know, that if they found out that they hadn't grown up in Middlesex, then they're not gonna necessarily pursue finding out about what it's like to go to school in Middlesex. You know? So um, some of that flexibility and practice uh, that they showed, as well as some of the cross-grade groupings, we allowed all three through six opportunities um, for this um, project. And I wanna give a shout out to Chip Hedler too for his support and work um, with that. Um, as well as that of our Middlesex elders. So um, I think a lot of, of those uh, teamwork and um, integrated thinking really helped. Um, Self-awareness and self-direction, really um, one area that I'm really proud of is Lauren's continued work with Winter Wellness, being um, the full school and then uh, we expanded opportunities this last year for people to really kind of select something that was of their um, kind of personal affinity. So we had everything from kind of hip hop dance to um, our typical ice skating, um, as well as gymnastics. So you see a, a lot of different opportunities for kids. Um, in addition to that, we were able to weave a lot of our growth mindset work into um, some of the, the new learning that kids were doing with ice skating and trying uh, with persistence and that type of thing. Um, and finally, our um, heart team, our social emotional team, uh, work this summer to try to um, really refine and define what we mean by social emotional learning and what are the core areas that we're looking for lagging skills in and what can we do about that to support students um, better 
We played around with um, kind of a screening tool where kids would do a self-assessment across those areas. And um, we're still gonna be kind of looking at those results. I think that the developmental piece kind of played into you know, some of that self-awareness. So, but that's something we're actively working on to, to build with students. So, um, just a sec, would it help to turn off the lights? I turned one off already. Yeah. Yes, um, no, no, it's okay. So, um, as we're looking at a student outcomes and connecting those to our SLOs, the two areas within the climate survey that we historically tracked are these two questions as they relate to number four and number six. So as school I work out problems I have with others, 81% indicating that they work out problems with others all or most of the time. Um, and then we have when I'm at school I have choices and what I learn. And this is something I feel like we have opportunities for growth in and we're working on um, through um, some of our strategies for this year. Um, the thing I'm actually most proud of here is do you see the number of responses? 121, so we were really um, very intentional to survey every kid, um, whereas last year um, our data was only with third and fourth grade, was all that was completed. So um, we were really trying to listen to our small friends and learners. So again, um, when we're looking at data, we're really looking for triangulation, and we do that by looking at um, reports from the administration, outside audits, such as SBAC, com comparisons to SU, and within grade levels. So in this report, we're gonna be looking at triangulation between different levels of assessment and outside audits, uh, which in this report is the SBAC. So um, when we consider literacy, great news is literacy is up this year. Um, last year was at 63.04%. And this year we're up to 69, so we're getting close to that 80%, which is great, um, of percent prof proficient in literacy. And you can see here, the beautiful thing, do you see the triangulation between our various measures? So I think that is some beautiful work there, um, looking at local um, assessments, which are, is the FMP. If you um, consider some of the work that we did last year around that, um, there's continuing to use the DRA2, as Bill indicated in his engine, indicated in their report, and then we're more consistently um, using the progress monitoring tool called START360. So as you look at this, I mean, the really nice thing is you see with STAR, this gives us kind of that early alert system as to when things are going off track. And our local assessments really give us that deep dive on what specifically is going on with kids in their um, literacy acquisition, so. Is this school, the whole school, an average of everybody in the school? Uh-huh, so the SBAC is only in grades three through six, mm -hmm. but the other measures are every one to varying degrees. So like, for instance, the what's feeding into this number in K3 is the FMP. In grades four through six is the DRA2, and we're putting the results in a scaled way as with the proficiency cut scores to come up with that composite. Does that make sense? So STAR 360 only represents the older kids, but everything else is representative of K through six? Uh, not, K is not represented, it's just in first six. grade. Okay. We do do various measurements. Um, you'll see those emerge in our spring monitoring report as um, kindergarten begins um, really dialing into some of the FMP stuff, um, but right here, um, it's grades first through six. So yeah. just to be clarify, I heard you say the SBAC was only the older kids, is that That's correct? correct? Okay. Yeah. The other ones yeah, that doesn't ready. start till third grade, it would be our first year. Um, and STAR, I'm trying to think, if, I believe that starts in literacy in second grade. I have to check the comprehensive assessment plan, so. Um, report card data is also lining up really nicely. So um, again, I think we've, we've got a, still a little work to do, but again, a, a game. Um, math, um, we still have some work to do, but it's better than last year. So um, last year, our math score was at 37.7% proficient, percent proficient. This year, we're up to 47.56. Um, 
Again, with this, we have STAR 360 um, that's deployed, as well as here's the report card data. You can see the triangulation is, or the correlation is not quite so strong. So I'd we're like still to working on say that. something to this. It's, it's just totally crossed my radar this year. Um, we found that when we found that study that said why do American kids perform relatively poorly on standardized tests compared to people from other countries and there was a comparison and they gave the American kids, they sort of have the standard and then they gave the American kids some kind of incentive and whoop, up went the scores. And so I've been asking my children and various other people that I drive around, um, you know, so, you know, tell me about these tests. And what they say to a person is that they don't try. That they, that, you know, if they know the answer, on, on that specifically, they're talking about math. If they know the answer, they'll, they'll do it. But they, you know, they don't put any effort in. And my sons in high school were like, oh yeah, you know, because once you finish the test, you can go on your phone and play. You know, so everybody's boop, 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 boop. So I noticed that same pattern in what Bill was describing in here. And I, I would be so curious to see if we develop some kind of an incentive system, mm -hmm. if, that's, if that's part of what's going on here. I or, think or you can go on your phone and play system. <laughs> right, but I mean, it, it really would explain the difference between you know that like seventeen point point difference between the you know the stuff that's hard you know that's hard. So well, I, I, I thought it was fascinating. I think what we're trying to do is start actually explaining to kids what these tools are actually uti utilized for and how it benefits them to give it their best go, because that's really the key. Is like you have to you have to scale that to yes. It's one moment in time. We don't want it defining who they are. You know, we want rich learning experiences and we have to be realistic that there's decision points that are made based on some of these these assessment tools. I, you know, I think that's great. And and some of them I think I'm sure we'll get it and others, you know, might not care. But it it, <laughs> it was um, but it was fascinating. And I, I know some kids are very, very regardless. anxious around testing. You know, that yeah. they really do care an enormous amount. But yeah. I was just curious to my, my sample well, was hundred percent. Yeah. So. I mean I was I was pleased to see us increasing, you know, our student, you know, proficiency scores and you know, quite honestly, I I did some checking around and so you know, one thing, and I'll, I'll get to this in just a minute, but, you know, I have a friend that's a consultant out in Seattle who uh, basically does math and literacy coaching throughout a, a large district out there. And I was like, you know, can you just tell me about SBAC scores? Because, you know, I've always heard, you know, we're really shooting for that 80%. You know, what do you think? Is that unrealistic? <coughs> like, does that ever happen? She's like, my district is freaking out because they just dropped below 80%. And um, I just, I know it's not, we want it to be right-sized in its level of importance, and the reality is our kids are in a global economy, and I want them to be, my, my heart wants them to have the best shot at whatever they want to do, you know. So um, I believe our kids are capable, and, you know, I want to make sure that we're doing everything from what I understand, the SPAC is the one way in which we can measure across the state and across the nation to a certain degree how we're, how we're doing. And so, um, you know, I think that if, if motivation was a universal issue, we would be seeing that show up right. in the test scores universally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. I mean, that was what this article was all about. Was <laughs> so, so, yeah. so what I guess what I'm saying is that if, if people... Um, if it's a lack of wanting to try, then if if we're below the um, what the proficiency level uh, expectation is, that means that there are certainly other schools that are lack or that don't lack for that motivation. Sure. Your students yeah. don't. No, so. I mean what I would say is I'm I'm guessing at 65 that that in this case the the report cards is probably a better assessment of what kids can do when they're pushed. Is 65 good enough? I don't know. I'm, I'm not making a statement about that one way or other. But I'm saying that that's, you know, we can begin to understand some discrepancy there. Um, one thing I think, um, just, you know, I actually showed this exact presentation to my staff and we had dialogue around this particular slide. And, you know, they, I was like, what are your thoughts? And um, kind of what they're also wondering is the math pilots now in, in place and they're considering that is, you know, how well are we calibrated around the stuff that's on the report card? 
okay, number one, and number two is how well are those things that we're measuring there represented in these other things. So I think it, it will, in the same way that we gave intentional work around trying to calibrate with each other in our literacy stuff, and certainly literacy is just generally um, slightly, uh, there's typically been more work done to, to align and calibrate more so than math, though a lot of work has gone into that in this district this, over the last few years. Um, you know, I think that's continued work is still needed. So um, they were also kind of agreeing with some of that. And we feel like through some of our work, we'll get a better sense of any potential gaps that we may have. And I think, um, yeah. So um, looking forward, um, the thing I really uh, want to emphasize is, you know, I know we've been talking about equity, but I do think it's really important for us to like look at that specific school level as, as far as considering how um, our children are doing and how our neighbor's children are doing because I, I genuinely care about how proficient all of them are. And we consider um, breaking down, this is one area that we didn't look at a whole lot last year, but I wanted for us to examine this year. And that is looking at um, various historically disadvantaged groups and how they're performing at Romney. So we consider that one year is basically 30 to 40 just guesstimating scale score points. Um, I wanted to show um, some of the differences. So what we're looking at here is a four-year composite because frankly, I can't look at various grade levels um, and protect pupil privacy without getting a, a large enough end. So this is over four years, our third grade math scores. And on this side, we've got our non-free and reduced. And on this side, we have our free and reduced lunches. And as you can see, there's a 71 point difference in how, the, I'm only looking at math, there's a 71 point difference in how they're performing in math. In fourth grade, there's 68 point, there's a 68 point difference, which again translated is, you know, over a year, if not two years worth of difference. Are you just doing free and reduced lunch or these IEPs as well? I'm sorry, I'm just This is just the free and reduced lunch okay. versus non-free and reduced lunch. And Amy, help us out with the color coding with yeah. the lines. Um, I so should be the following along here. Is but proficient. Okay, okay so that's the, the big thick bar in the middle mm -hmm. on this right. And then where is the it on this one? yellow line is the median. Okay. Okay, and all the dots represent where kids are. Data points. Mm -hmm. And then on this one, there is no black. Uh, that may be because in this one, it's the same as the yellow and it's Got it. Hidden. Okay. I believe in that okay. screenshot one. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So this is fourth grade math. We've got a 68 point spread. Uh, fifth grade, over four years, so it's 40 points. And sixth grade is 56 points. When we um, examine the um, special ed versus not special ed, um, the differences are more um, substantial. So here are the general ed students. Okay. And then when we look at how special ed students are performing in grades three, four, five, and six, in third grade we have a 120 point difference for about three years. Uh, fourth grade 108 point difference, fifth grade 114 point difference, and sixth grade 99 points. And I think it's these areas that concern me most um, because I feel like um, that is, uh, is substantive. And in fact, when you compare across districts, um, <coughs> I know our kids can do better um, as far as how their performance is aligning. Um, so, yeah. So we look at just report card data. This is a perfect, perfect percent uh, proficient in each SLO area according to the report card. So as you can see, they're doing great in PE <laughs> and art. And this is all grades. Hmm? This is all grades, yes. And this is 2007, the last year, right? 
Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then these are the two data points as far as math and literacy. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I'm just curious, and I'm not as familiar with the curriculum as students get older, but um, what is the science, like do they have a substantive enough science experience that they can get assessed on their science proficiency in elementary school? I don't, I don't feel great about where our science is. Okay, and is that where global citizenship, I mean, would well, fit as That well? would be the partner. Social to studies. That. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's just a question that okay. I have, if they don't actually have a, a science curriculum. Uh, <laughs> during the day that is science or social studies right now, and so. I only know for my children's grade levels, which is 30 minutes twice a week. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I think it varies based on the unit, and I personally would love to see us do more work around unit development in those two areas, because I think, is particularly as you consider next-gen science standards um, and how they align to our SLOs within um, science, there's a broader um, area, there's a, a really broad spread of um, content areas just within science. And while I feel like we do a great job with biology, you know, I, I would love for us to make sure that we're doing equally as good with physics and all of those other things. So, um, yeah. Jack came home telling me about awesome. So. <laughs> Something happened <laughs> What is proficiency in PE? Um, that you is based, yeah, yeah there's mind. actually um, a new tool. Play. So the other thing, Katie, that I would point out about science is the, formerly we, we had, you know, um, like a, the, the new science instrument was just piloted for the state last year, and we haven't gotten, like, those released results. So like, whereas I previously had an ECAP science to share, the new tool isn't ready quite yet. I do think that as we get more proficient and see, you know, that's a challenging tool, you know, it's gonna elevate that area. So I, I, I agree with you. I was mainly wondering how robust the assessment could be from a teacher if they don't have much time in their day to actually be teaching science or social studies. If their assessment, how much is actually based on? That's just my question. It's not. Yeah. Right. I understand what the system is, so that's why I'm questioning the yeah. level of proficiency based on how much time it might be mm -hmm. actually measuring. I think there's definitely opportunities for growth there. So, did you have a question? Here? Yeah, what's proficiency in PD? Oh, so there is this thing called a fitness grant, which has been implemented at state level, and she's utilizing some of that, but actually, uh, Lauren does a great job of collecting formative data that she uses. There are specific competencies that they're looking for in their students. Yeah. And skills. Any other questions? So, um, state of the system in general, we're going to look at the desired state of the system report. Um, again, we've got report cards aligned to all the SLO areas for grade levels. That's still a relatively new addition, um, and we're refining our, our calibration there. Um, this year, you know, we have increased the use of Infinite Campus to open the portal to parents and utilize the um, uh, uh, report card feature in there so you can track how kids are doing, both formatively and summatively, um, and teachers are utilizing that more for planning and scoring and reporting purposes. Um, we've identified yearly improvement targets for student performance, specifically in math. Um, so we, I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, we are looking for continued improved outcomes for students in social emotional areas and a learning environment that supports all students. So the math goal that, um, that you saw in the big spreadsheet down there, we um, utilized our STAR 360 results and teachers analyzed how many kids that they felt like um, they could really move um, to set a target. And we really utilize kind of the metaphor of a marathon. If you're training for a marathon, you're gonna actually, and you're just going out and you're getting ready for it and you're, you have in your head that you're just gonna do your best. Or, you know, do you go out and you're like, I'm gonna do this marathon in X amount of time 
as you're training, which one will get you probably closer to your goal is the more specific target. And so that was um, some of our thinking around that. So in the September administration of STAR 360, we had 50 students proficient out of 123 math students. Um, our teachers have collectively determined that by June, we can have 77 um, students proficient. So we're really um, making some um, goals in that way. So a is quick that, question? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, you can go first. Um, is that what that data that Bill was showing is? That's saying going between, <coughs> is that going between fall and spring, you're trying to get ex essentially accelerated growth more than just, because if it's one, we're we're just, these are the number of kids that we're trying to close that achievement gap. Right now, they're at like a level one or two. We're trying to move them up to a three. So when I look at this, what I'm reading is we have 100% of kids who have grown at one year, have, oh, have achieved one year's growth yet. at one year. Uh, no. But is it one year's growth in less than one year? Can I get to that? Yep. Sorry, okay, go so ahead. This is, about, this is about the achievement goal. Yeah. This is the growth goal. And we are shooting for all kids at Romney School to have one full year's worth of growth according to their growth percentile. So if you look at the speed of their growth, of course, those that we're closing the gap on are going to need to do more than that, right? But right now, what they, sh what we're kind of shooting for is to like get that up to 77 out of 123 kids is what their goal is. Yeah. So there's no way for us to demonstrate that kids are, we're closing the achievement gap based on that second paragraph right there because we can't get greater than 100%. Am I understanding that correctly then? 100% um, just means everybody's doing at least one year, but we can't in any way reflect that some students are doing more than one year to close the gap. I guess I didn't give them, that wasn't like a given option, that's a great question. Okay. All I can say is people are very committed to ensuring that kids make at least one year's growth. And of course, in order to achieve this, more than one year's growth, we right. would need to be doing that for many kids. Yes. Um, this may be too far in the weeds, and so I apologize, and you, you can tell me if you don't know. Yeah. But uh, so looking at what the, what the current state is and what the goal is, we're looking at 27 kids to have, to exceed 100%, uh, one year of growth this year, correct? Is that? We're, we're moving them from basically a level two to a level, level three. three. And it, when I was looking at the gap charts, which I'm horrible at really understanding, um, are, are we, re is that sort of focusing on getting the, the kids that are, a lot of these kids close, and it's just a matter of getting them an, an extra boost to get them over, or are we, or, or is this, is this a, a big lift? Um, for, for staff to have to, to be able to do? Um, I think what I would say is this exercise was a challenge because our systems around data are still so new. Yeah. So I would liken it to trying to track uh, an infant's eating, okay? So if you're the mom, you know how much normal intake is for that six month old. If you're babysitting for that kiddo, you're gonna have an idea of about how much they should be taking in, but you won't be dialed into their specific intake, right? The same way, I think as we do these systems around data, we're gonna see what is able to be done through all, all of us pulling towards closing the gap on this specific skill for a child. So with, you know, Chip dialing into that and the classroom teacher dialing into that, we haven't tracked it closely enough up until now to really get a sense of what's possible for kids. And so even setting this goal was kind of stressful. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the, it's the habits around uh, data use and informing our next steps with kids that will give us a better, um, gauge of what's possible and what we can do when we're together. So, um, 
Amy, remind me what math program we're using. Um, we don't have a math program. Okay. Is this sort of central agendas? Kind there, of there's uh, right now they're piloting um, two different programs okay. uh, this year um, to sort of support that. They're currently um, they've got many resources available yeah. and that type of thing, but I wouldn't say that it's a program. I, I Does that make think sense? that sounds like an excellent approach. And were we using one last year? A program? Yeah. I mean, no. for a while there was like we're using X program and like um, yeah, but it's. Okay, yeah. that's great. I, yeah, I don't feel any need to have a program. I think, um, teachers are very much at run me at least in support of. Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so the current state is that we're supporting teachers in increased use of Infinite Campus, specifically around the electronic gradebook and navigating the portal. Um, again, teachers begin setting those growth goals for all overall math proficiency. Um, we've added our to our literacy resources and continue to work on our MTSS system around supporting um, kids and um, that's showing improvements overall. Math continues to show some deficits in student achievement, particularly for historically disadvantaged kids, though it's improved over last year. So again, actions to happen this year, the data team is really where we're going to get a sense of what we can do when we're all pulling towards the same goal in closing that achievement gap. Math, uh, they're currently piloting bridges and there's one other program that they're gonna be piloting. I haven't heard what one it is. Um, we're using the, um, we have the use of math menu to increase student voice and choice, hopefully um, increasing their um, kind of agency. And um, we have the implementation of uh, Dreambox adaptive technology on a limited basis. And literacy, um, again, the increase of student voice and choice in readers' workshop. Um, we had a great example of Ben's work around that today at all school meeting uh, for strong tier one instruction and extension. And there's um, the continued analysis of student formative data around life and social and emotional skills. So we're still trying to track that at a pretty low level so we can get kids uh, support across, you know, Chris and Sharon and some other classroom uh, resources as well as deepening staff skills and supporting these areas in tier one. So one area that I would like to point out is Sharon has pulled some uh, brain-based work to um, also beef up our tier one instruction, instruction in these areas, so kudos to her. Um, again, you know, this kind of, you've seen this uh, diagram before, but as far as supporting teachers, we're really using our staff time um, to try to identify um, times that w they can work together and collaborate um, strongly in these areas, particularly with IC. Um, this is, and the relation to the um, implementation plan is at the bottom, which goal they relate to. Uh, the full staff learning, we're gonna try to support um, continued implementation of um, those areas. We have the monthly data team where we'll be looking at specifically reading and math and how kids um, are doing in the progress monitoring. And then open space is a time that's responsive to teacher needs and they can, can convene groups across um, the school to kind of dial into various areas of expertise and sharing. So. All right, finally, how you can help as a board. Uh, continued support for systems at Tier 1 and 2 for students in literacy, math, and social and emotional learning, um, I think would be one. Um, to promote across um, your various constituents, our improved bus outcomes, improved behavior data, improvements in student both literacy and math scores, which we've looked at. Uh, the other two were from our um, spring monitoring report. And supporting uh, the closing of the achievement gap in our school and then realizing that sustaining change is hard and transition periods are hardest. So we're still, I would say, very much in a growth place and you know, it's not uh, all ironed out, and, uh, but I think we're making progress. So that's what I wanted to highlight. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know it's a lot of work and really appreciate all the effort you put into this. Um, okay, that takes us.
So I'm sorry if I'm struggling here. So we have had the fiscal report to the board, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. The we've administration, we're waiting on bill. We've actually never approved. Your administration report for this month is what Amy just did. Correct. Okay, so it's Amy's principal right. administration. Principal, all right. The <coughs> bill is not necessarily coming. Right. He was here and he left. He was here and he left. So okay. we still have to approve minutes and we still have to deal with we our action agenda. We still have to approve agenda. the minutes. We Thank have you. minutes. Okay. Yep. All right. So do I have a motion vis-a-vis -vis the minutes? Is there, would there be a reason uh, not to table them to allow other we can table them. board members to weigh in just in case? There's a pretty, sure. I have some thoughts yeah. uh, and so I'm guessing that others might too. too. I, I agree. Yep. Okay. Um, Okay, um, um, Amy, I wanted to ask you, I guess this, this is probably following up on the student monitoring report or the, the administrative report to the board. I understand that there have been, um, you know, that the schedule has, uh, you know, the staff have had concerns and have met with you over the schedule. And I'm wondering if you can kind of characterize what some of those concerns are and, you know, what sure. your thoughts are. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, um, to be honest, like, it has not been easy sledding. <laughs> and, um, so at, I guess it's been two or three weeks ago, I basically said to the staff, you know, here are the things that, you know, I think are important for us to maintain, such as dedicated tier two times, such as adequate size blocks, such as days looking similar, and equity between teachers for planning, as well as students in the amount of time in the, in the schedule. Um, and I said, basically, if you guys have, I'm happy to shred it if we can maintain those things in a better way. Um, if you see small wins that you wanna pursue, I put it back to you. And the group as a whole decided to make some small adjustments in the practice of it and um, has not decided to continue to pursue um, major adjustments. So that was, that was their like teacher leadership putting it back um, to them to decide what was best. Um, and I have, you know, I just sort of have heard that there have been a lot of conversations mm -hmm. around it. I haven't heard what those teacher concerns are. Who are you, hear, I think, who are you hearing this oh, from? I get emails all the time, like two or three weeks. From, from, from sometimes staff? Sometimes from staff, more from parents who sort of are, are concerned through the grapevine. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, th this begs the question of the board you know, who we're, who we're getting information from. But, but let me, we can talk about that. But Amy, I wanna hear, I just wanna hear what sort of, what are the concerns so we can understand what that full conversation looks like. I think that we're still grappling with what, um, what uh, is fair within our staff um, as far as um, teaching responsibilities. Uh, uh, you know, I think there's concerns, you know, there, there are certain, I don't want to put it, um, I feel very strongly that from a management standpoint, people deserve the same amount of planning time, and that's not necessarily um, embraced. Um, in addition to that, I think um, what we, the win that we were able to do is to have teachers help with the transition times in between special classes. Um, but I think the amount of classes that special teachers are teaching is not familiar and they're trying to figure out the best way to utilize that time. Um, Can you say that sentence again? The amount of classes that special teachers are teaching? Mm -hmm. Um, so they're yeah. teaching fewer classes or less hours, or is it the structure of it? They're teaching more or classes. classes. They're teaching more classes, mm -hmm. and they're shorter in time. They are because shorter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I think figuring out how to best utilize that time, as well as the, um, you know, uh, that is something that's different for them. Mm -hmm. So you mean like um, the Spanish teacher might be teaching more Spanish classes for a shorter period of time? Is that? They're like or that's just, not the the. I mean, that, not like that's in any way. Okay, fine. The yeah. the dojo teacher might be teaching. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. 
um, of, uh, an increased number of dojo classes, but for a shorter amount of time. Is that what you were saying? Right. I think it's not just that, but they've typically had gaps in between their classes, which don't currently, when they're trading between, aren't happening. Um, but nor do they happen for a regular classroom teacher. So I feel like that's some a, something that they can, you know, um, learn to work with, hopefully over time. Um, but you know, I'm open to other ideas if they have them. In fact, I went back and was like, you know, would it be better for us to alternate in an A week special schedule and a B week and give you longer periods with kids? Like, could that be a win? Um, I've said, you know, could we uh, have, you know, some irregularity in how much special classes that they're having? And, you know, um, so I'm open to their ideas. Uh, I don't know that they're necessarily, um, yeah. What about the classroom teachers? Uh, the classroom the teachers, from what I've heard, are appreciating the collaboration time. Um, I think some grades, you know, we've had a slight shortening in the upper fifth, sixth grade class um, for their planning time compared to last year um, to augment that two hours and 40 minutes difference between them and mm -hmm. the, the primary grades. So, um, you know, I think they're figuring that out too. Um, but, yeah. I'm not, I'm not surprised that, that, you know, this is, we're hearing this just because it's, uh, it's not a small change, mm -hmm. and you know, changes can be hard, and there's adjustments to be made. I'm curious to, to see at the end, uh, because one of the opportunities that was created for this was around uh, core instruction and then um, follow-up instruction in both math and literacy, mm -hmm. and what are the results um, of that in student learning uh, at the end of the year. I, mean, I think that would also be a really revealing um, to how this how this has worked because um, I think ultimately um, when we were, came out of that retreat uh, or talked about it in the meeting or two following it mm -hmm. that idea of you know creating that time uh, how important that was and so well and I think I'm of course you know <coughs> anxious for us to look pretty early in the spring at how to improve it for next year, um, as well as, you know, and there's parts of it that, you know, now I, I, I think we're at a point where we want to see if there's a way to tease out. Um, I, I'm hoping that our math numbers will get in better check for next year um, to where we could even have tier two happening at a different time um, and look for up small wins there. Um, you know, it's, it's still kind of back to back with our core math class. So um, just to make it a little bit more distinct. So I, I would I encourage think you to have a longer view though. I feel like saying one year and hoping for like seeing results from this kind of change, I feel like that would be, that's optimistic. But two years, three years, now we're talking. I just, I think that, I think you're asking a lot of yourself potentially and a lot of a schedule more than, I don't know, maybe not, but I know Katie I, wanted to I'm, say I feel that. sure that we can improve on it. Oh know, yeah, no, it's, for um, sure. You know, but I, I've I've tried to be open to seeing if there's ways that we can adjust it to make it work for for everybody. I think schedules typically a pretty um, tricky place mm -hmm. for any staff. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to um, express my concern with the reduction in time allied arts in terms of the length of the section of classes. It looks, it doesn't look like much on paper, and especially I think if you're not in a classroom setting, but going from 40 to 30 minutes, when you imagine young children in an art class for 30 minutes, is um, a minuscule amount of time to accomplish, um, to accomplish much. So then you can imagine, I think, the um, stress that might occur if you're teaching more of those very short sections in a day um, in terms of the setup, the run through the lesson, the pack up, and then the quick transition to a new group. Um, so I would I would ask for a careful review of that um, for next year so that they can have longer time. And I think that um, the scores and the closing achievement gap is of course important, um, but we can't do 
all of that at the expense of the arts and a whole, having a holistic education for our students because there are um, so many ways of learning and so many ways of developing and I think that we um, really do a disservice to a lot of people by limiting their experience with the allied arts and I see that in the reduction of time that they have in Spanish um, and I fear that with their current very short um, allied arts classes so I want a careful look at that of how to so my understanding is that it sounds correct me if I'm wrong but it sounded like that has been a big discussion at some of the meetings and maybe you guys are talking about how you can tweak the schedule to accommodate longer blocks like maybe an A week and a B week where we have offered that and yeah. it hasn't been yeah. something that they um, were wanting to pursue and, and this is actually a really big part of our discussion that we're having like we're really talking about kind of defining our goals and if we really decide as schools that we are really focused on trying to meet literacy goals and numeracy goals um, then I think those I think we have to like then I think it has to be like we really want to close the achievement gap and then there's no but after that and that's the kind of decision that I think we're trying to make is that a, do I understand oh, well, this correctly I, I in the next few weeks? That's an absolutely critical question. It is. We, you know, our community has sort of consistently come out for this holistic vision. You know, that really right. emphasizes the arts. It really emphasizes nature education. You know, when we did when Jan Miller Arsenal led us through that entire visioning thing, you know, it was sort of consistent, group after group after group, we're saying that. And so what we're looking at now with the student guarantee is a very different model. It's very and specific. Yeah. I think we really need to have a meeting at Romney where we bring people in and say, look, we're establishing values. You know, what are you thinking? Mm -hmm. um, because um, I, um, you know, I think I'm probably more in tune with what Katie's saying and, and with what, what the community is. I, I think there are real limitations to looking at measuring, um, you know, what students are learning through the lens of these very specific um, tests. And so... You know, but what are our values? We need to figure that out, and we, we haven't got that at this point. And then that'll make your life a lot easier when we know as a board. Here's what well, I'm and one thing that I'm I'm just concerned about is that. I mean, even where our math scores are, was news to my teachers, because historically, years ago, we typically did quite well. Um, against other measures and it's not that I want us to be reductionist in how we're looking at students or assessment or anything but I feel like when we're having this discussion they already feel like that box is checked of proficiency and I don't want there to be a misunderstanding that 47 percent of our kids are not where we necessarily would hope they would be in math and that's going to matter for them come middle school, high school, the rest of their lives, you know? And so I just, I want those priorities to be established upon like, do you feel that way if your child is lagging in math? Well, according you to know? this, I mean, and we, that's where looking at the measurement, you know, and, and I haven't done yeah. the research I'd like to do, um, but you know, that's where it is really critical. The difference between 47% on the, you know, SVAC and 65%. Yeah, and, you know, I that's mean, a, that's a I big would difference. look, yeah, is 65 good enough? I don't know. You know, I really don't. Um, but yeah, so that's where that's um, where my head is. I just I think as a board, I encourage us to have the conversation, the sort of the the latter conversation of what are the overarching priorities rather than the former of micromanaging the schedule. Totally. Yeah. Um, just one. Yeah. I agree, but do you? But I, I feel like we have to ask those questions. Like, are we willing to say, would we, would we, for instance, be willing to completely and totally cut Spanish out of Romney if we, you know, if our central office and our administration thought that was what was needed to reach that our our reading and literacy goals? And I feel like that question is something that we have to address. Oh, I hundred percent agree. Yeah, I, I when I talk about that, that's the type of thing that I'm talking about. Okay. Is having those. What are our priorities? What you okay. know? What um, I don't know if you both left at the time uh, of, the, of the last meeting, but what are what are we willing to do uh, to to change, um, and whatever that might be. Uh, and so, I think those are the conversations you need to have, and then they can then materialize themselves when the professionals kind of put together the. The schedule but yeah. not us 
Yeah, and maybe, um, I don't know if it's reasonable to ask you, Amy, but I, Amy's been putting in uh, an incredible amount of work meeting with parents. So my understanding is she's been meeting, you've been meeting with groups of parents like since the beginning of the summer. Um, and so I'm wondering if you've gotten a feel, that very question that you asked, what do the parents of the kids who are not proficient in math and literacy, how are they feeling about, you know, where the goals of the school should be. Do you think that any of your talks with these parents might be able to help that question or no? I still have, I still have much work to do yeah. on connecting with those parent groups and have been really thinking through like how do we get the thin and thick engagement okay. around some of this uh, prioritizing and um, so yeah. Um, kind of weighing like whether we need focus groups or mm -hmm. you know around topics or you know, weekly, you know, feedback question, something like that to, you know, but I think uh, I want to make sure things are part of my um, desire is to make sure that we're basing this decision making on the current facts mm -hmm. and that, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I, I do believe we can catch it, you know, and um, get back to a more reasonable um, outcomes for kids that I would, I, I know our kids are capable of, so. I think I, I really appreciate your comments, Katie. I think these are just, you know, I, I struggle with this so much because I intuitively feel the same way. Like, of course, we should, we should have, they, should, they should learn Spanish and French and Latin and art. But um, I struggle with, like, the question of how, you know, what our goals are going to be and what we choose and do we have to choose. And part of me thinks, like, well, if, if we can – if we can get our, our kids doing better in math and reading, then maybe, you know, here in two or three years, we could branch out and start doing more again. But, you know, so I think that those are the discussions and I, they're really hard. I mean, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that having diversity in your yeah. education mm -hmm. is incredibly effective at improving your skill in many things. And there's, it's been very well studied in music in terms of early study of music being incredible for later you know, development in math and literacy. So I think um, reading can help you read, but music can also help you do math. So I think that um, being only uh, sort of point A to point B about it <coughs> might not be the only path to get there. That's what I don't want to lose. Well, and I think to that point, uh, what we also have to be mindful of is, is the data around um, uh, sort of the disparity in in the achievement gap between the privileged and um, um, those that are disadvantaged. And because I 100% I, I agree uh, with the idea of, um, you know, kids may come to school excited about, they, they, they spend their whole day waiting to get to that one thing. Uh, and, you know, you don't want to take away that opportunity. Uh, but music, music, for example, a great learning opportunity, but is, but is that a learning opportunity that is accessible to everyone? Uh, or is it only accessible to the people that can afford uh, an instrument? Um, and if, if it is something that should be, it's a value that should be available to everyone, then, then we need to allocate resources to make that happen. But again, tough decisions. Uh, but you know, to me, those are, those are the finer details uh, that at least I'm thinking about uh, when we're looking at, um, looking at that gap. I think the other thing is just to be aware that when it all sugars out, we're talking four hours of instruction that we've got a day, you know, to split all of these variety of ways. By the time you factor in recess. 90 minutes of literacy and 60 minutes of math and. We're out of time. Like it is. Where did the other two hours yeah, go? Not. You've got lunch, you've got recess, you've got your specials and you've got your morning meetings. Just you've got, you've got transition times yeah. with little kids that you have to factor in. I mean, the reality is, I... Can we just hook them all up to feeding tubes? <laughs> <laughs> we need a long no, I mean, we do need more time, and I worry, you know, if, if we don't someday look at that, you know, that it, it does get very limiting. Um, and I, I also worry about more complicated kids that we're getting, because the, the demographics in Middlesex are changing. And we were seeing kids with significant needs uh, 
across the district, which is why we're doing so much of the trauma work and that type of thing, but it's in our backyard too. And I think research would also say that it's, when you have a gap to close, you, you've got to be even more careful about having that um, really strong direct tier one instruction that's um, you know, both engaging, but also really working on ensuring that we're getting um, good outcomes for all kids, even ones that are coming to us you know, with significant um, maybe gaps in their learning. Great discussion. I hope we, it's something we can continue in a, in a larger community setting. Um, let's see, help me out here. So are we ready to move to the action agenda? Yes. I think we are. We have not been updated on the budget process. We'll try and catch Bill before he leaves. Um, so can I have a motion for 5.1? Uh, I don't think we can take action on that because that was, we had to first uh, adopt those at the full board, oh, and we didn't do that, that right. was Sorry. if it was done. I don't. It was. I don't think it was done. So we don't know what if any changes were made or anything like that. So. Okay. Um, five point two. We're going to uh, postpone table for today. I don't know anything about five point three. Approve retirement opt out for teachers. Does anyone? No. And I think we better postpone yeah, that one as well. well. Table that one as well. Um, and we already achieved five point four. Um, principal preservation policy we tabled but I wanted to get this um, I had proposed some changes to it I'd like to get that in the record so I've sent it to Christy do we need to read it for the video camera or can we just hand these guys a copy yeah, we can put it in the minutes and then, the minutes so it's in the minutes. anyone who is watching this will be in the minutes in five available in five days so uh, Chris had proposed a principal preservation policy that would uh, effectively before a superintendent could ask a principal to leave, or to put a principal on leave, the, an emergency meeting of the board would have to be called, and the board would have to uni um, approve with a majority vote to agree for that principal to be put on leave. And so I made some changes. I was recommending some changes, so this was just something that I was putting up for discussion that I wasn't entirely in favor of the principal preservation policy and I felt like it should be more inclusive of all staff um, and along those lines I also think we need to exit interviews should be a requirement that the board um, conduct exit interviews for all staff but I don't think that's really part of this policy I don't, I don't see how that would be <laughs> fitting in there but um, so anyway this is what I did and uh, the changes I, you can see the things that were crossed out and the new wording is all in um, that squiggly stuff, italics. And Allison, I haven't had a chance to look at this. There is a very specific um, policy about the, the superintendent removing or the principal removing staff members. Is that something you've looked at, or do we need so to? So the thing is, is that this? really the board has no jurisdiction over any staff Anybody member else, beyond correct. the principal. Yep. But it was the principal of the thing. <laughs> That, and I, so I put in here, if the, if the school board developed any sort of responsibility over other staff members, that I felt like we should have the same. So I guess it was Got sort it. of a okay. forward looking, if something were to change, I think any and all staff members that the board fires and hires and or has jurisdiction over in some way, I guess I feel like we should be involved in the same way. So I didn't want to limit it to the principal. So Got that it. was really the main change okay. that, that I created. And originally I had talked about um, maybe adding the superintendent and the um, assistant superintendent and, and then depending on whether or not that person was involved the principal as voting members for that meeting but Chris talked me out of it so I think the board members have to be the board the voting members the board is a board yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. anyway um, any want any preliminary discussion we'll talk about it later we can just sure. talk about it later okay. I just wanted to make sure right. that people there. have it yep. so that they can read it okay um, number 6.0, can I have a motion to approve the board orders? Mm -hmm. So moved. Uh, I move to approve $29,463.41. We have to read the amount in, don't we? That's what it was, right? Let's check. I don't know, where is it? It's right here. Oh. $2,463.41? No. $29,463.41, yes, that's correct. Okay. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. 
Uh, future agenda items, I have quite a number here from that we didn't, um, that we tabled for today. Anything else that we want to talk about? I want to, um, Bill had sent me an email um, about the principal evaluation process, so it would be helpful for us to maybe go over what that is. I, I gather it needs to be done by January, so it is coming up sooner rather than later. Can you just repeat that, would you say? Sure, that we're talking about future agenda items. Okay. Um, is, it, is that something that we have discussed as a board? Uh, not yet. So it was in response to a question. Okay. Um, so he um, he has some you know, kind of a very specific sense of what the legal requirements are, which he can lay out for us, and we can decide what, if anything, we would like to do in addition to that. Um, so is that a suggest? Is that is that in a specific agenda? Item? That I'm putting that on as a specific agenda item for some time when we have bills here. Um, and I will make up a list of all the future agenda items that we did not get to from today. Anything else that we would like to cover? Um, so we've tabled the board work plan and priorities. Uh, and while it pains me to say this, I fail to understand how we can get through this in one meeting. I'm wondering if we shouldn't table that further because I think the student monitoring report and talking about our student monitoring goals are probably more important at this point. Does that feel okay to you, Brian? Yeah, because we're getting the budget too. We have, yeah. we're just, there's no time for it, so. Much as I like paper clips, it's just not happening, I think. Um, so our thought is that we will focus on the student monitoring report mm -hmm. and student guarantee in our next meeting. Yeah. Um, I think this is a conversation that people, I've, I've received so much feedback being appreciative of um, us letting people know what's going on on the board um, and in upcoming meetings. Um, I wonder if one of us would like to put out a front porch forum posting saying, we'll be talking about this, you know, we'd welcome uh, community feedback and participation. We can do it as a board, um, or somebody can do it individually, or nobody can do it at all. I will probably do it individually if we don't do it as a board. Brian, you want to do it as a board? The, I'm sorry, I said it so was a, to have a... To post, if we're talking about student monitoring report, student guarantee, and basically what our values are as a board, mm -hmm. um, that seems to be an important conversation yeah. to let Free. people know that oh, we're yeah. having. Yeah, um, and so the question is, do we want to put out, as a board, a statement on Front Porch Forum saying, we will be talking about student monitoring report, student guarantee, and our board values at our next meeting on November 9th or whatever. We need to explain a little what that means. I think we do. Yeah. 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 Values could, it's also, yeah, that's a. I can write something up and I'll email it to everybody, including your different email address. Please. Yeah. And um, I can try to do the next couple days. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. And then if everybody likes it, we'll send it out as a board. Did that work okay. for us? Okay. And if they don't, then we can um, do it individually. To, yeah. to, to the point, though, of, of posting, mm -hmm. is that uh, to my original point of my argument for why I'm concerned, is that um, on, two, on your two different posts, you talk about being a, an independent community, just as a community member, yet later on in the post, you talk about, we will be talking about this as a board. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, again, there's the, the separation isn't isn't there, uh, so I'm just bringing that to your attention. Okay, um, I will um, try and be uh, clear. I did think about that phrasing, and it felt too awkward to say the board will be talking about it. Um, and I thought I had established my um, my space, but I appreciate the feedback. I'll take that into consideration. Okay, board calendar communication. Uh, I think we've just covered that. Um, so unless there's anything further to discuss, um, let's adjourn at 8.50.